Good morning and buenos dias. Greetings and welcome as we gather together, and I also welcome those who are joining us by video. Uh, in your bulletin is a little slip of paper. If you'd please put on your name and contact information, that would be helpful if we have to get hold of you. Also, um, I do go through those each week as part of my prayers, and so if you want to write prayer requests or anything you want to communicate to me that's nice, um, go ahead and put that on the back of the slip. And if it's just for my eyes only, just write private, and I'll be the only one that gets it. Otherwise, uh, also it can go on the prayer chain that way. Alonzo has said it's very important for me to announce that Lynn Middle School, there'll be a concert that he's going to be in Tuesday at 6.30. Also, the in-betweeners will be meeting Friday at 6 o'clock. Um, our community has an awful lot of senior citizen programs available, and so someone is going to come from that group to tell us all that the Las Cruces makes available for seniors, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. Let's see, I need to call on Mary, please. <coughs> it's Mary Maley again, the moderator of the admin committee. Um, in case you haven't noticed, Linda Ramirez has retired. Our office hours are now 11 to 2. It's in your bulletin. It's on all the doors. Again, our office hours are now 11 to 2. Um, we still monitor Linda at FPC. Dot LC in order to, for you to keep things the same. Um, and we want to surprise Linda with a monetary gift from the congregation. I mentioned this last week that this is a non-tax deductible contribution, so it does not go through the church. It goes through admin committee member Wanda Matisse, and someone said, who's Wanda? So Wanda's sitting over here. She'll raise her hand so you all can see her. She, I, didn't, I told her I wouldn't make her stand up. I'd just make her raise her hand. So <laughs> Wanda's over there. She's coordinating our surprise gift. Get your, your um, money in cash or check form made out to Wanda to her by November 12th so that we can surprise Linda and thank her for her 24 years of service to the church. I also need to let you know that due to medical reasons with problems with her eyes, Vanessa Medina, our nine-year bookkeeper, is now only helping us on a consulting basis. So in the interim, you get J.C. Loam in Austin and me. I am not a bookkeeper. I am an engineer by training and a project manager by career, which means I know how to coordinate people to do things. And so we are keeping books at fpc.lc as the way you communicate for anything for bookkeepers. Um, your donations still go in the purple boxes. We still need them. And reimbursements go the same way. You have to have um, approval before we're going to write anybody a check. Thank you. Bon. On the back of your bulletins, uh, another trunk or treat announcement. I keep talking about this. It's kind of fun to talk about. Um, one question I get about trunk or treat is, how much candy should I bring? Um, a lot. <laughs> uh, in the past, we serve hot dogs, and we serve about 500, and we run out. Um, so I'm thinking we have about 1,000 people, maybe about half of those are kids. So you might plan on 500 people, and, and that's an awful lot of people that we're able to serve because of you. And um, if, if you don't know what to do, you can always give candy. Man, we can always use extra candy, and we can always use people in their trunks giving out candy. So both those things are great things to do. Uh, you can fill out this form if you want and just drop it in a purple box. You don't have to. Uh, all it does is help us plan. But if you're not in the mood to fill it out, just come anyway. And uh, sure, sure appreciate you. Uh, every year I, I sort of like panic. It's like, are we going to have enough people? And trust God, right? And I forget that lesson every year. <laughs> but it's always great. We always have a great congregation helping us. So thank you. Let us prepare for worship. The uh, meditation is from Romans 14.
Please join me in calling ourselves to worship using the words printed in our bulletin. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. Please pray with me. Lord of all, your love and your faithfulness are unending and sustain us in ways beyond our understanding. You care for us and hear our prayers even when we are selfish, foolish, or muddle our words. You make things come out right even when we have given up in despair. How awesome and wise are your ways, O Lord. We thank you. Allow us to see you with the eyes of faith and to hear with understanding what you say to us. Awaken in us a longing to do what is right. Oh, may our focus be upon you, that we may find faith and life, healing and hope. We ask this in Jesus' name who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We try to live faithful lives that please the Lord, but we also make mistakes and fail. We say and do things that we regret and cause harm. But our God is infinitely loving and merciful. Through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and the Holy Spirit will guide and empower us to live more faithfully as God intends. Let us join in praying the prayer of confession. Lord, you are the creator of all things, and we are part of your creation. You call us to live in faithfulness with you and in loving harmony with others. We are too easily distracted by our wants and desires because our perspective is too small and focused on ourselves. By your grace and power, cleanse us of our selfishness and enlarge our lives. May we be more faithful, more caring, more just, and more merciful. Teach us to treasure your truth, that hereafter we might not willfully sin against you. Help us, Lord, by your power and spirit to live more faithful lives that reflect your truth and grace. O oh Lord, grant that in the silence we may hear your voice. Amen. Hear the good news. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. Now, cleansed from sin, how would God have us live?
right. If I could have the young disciples join me up front. All right, how are you all today? Well, so we are looking at the New Testament reading today, and we're going to zoom out. We're going to let Pastor Norm focus on the hard part. We're going to just zoom out and tell the story a little bit. So what we got to understand, Jesus, he had just come into Jerusalem uh, that week. On Monday, what he did is he flipped over the table of the money changers. Those were the people outside the temple who took real money, and turned it into money kind of like this. You ever played a game with money like this? Monopoly? Yeah. Well, real quick, uh, would you help me pass these? Everybody gets one stack. Yeah. All right, so Jesus, he had thrown out the money changers, and we don't know exactly what he said, but it was probably something akin to, it is God, not money, that delivers us from evil. God, not money, who gives us our daily bread. God, not money, who forgives our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so they've been run out, and the Pharisees, they didn't like that. They kind of liked the money changers. They couldn't say anything because Jesus was right, but they kind of liked money changers and they liked money. So they thought, I know, we'll come up with a trap. And so the Pharisees, they come up to Jesus a few days later and they say, hmm, Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to the emperor? And See, that was a trap because if Jesus says, yes, we should pay our taxes, that's the right thing to do then what they're going to do is they're going to go tell all the other Israelites, Jesus has given away the promised land. He's siding with Rome, so he can't do that. He can't say yes. But if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, well, that's no good, because then he's going to uh, go to the other side and he's going to tell Rome. Right? They're going to, the Pharisees, they're going to tell Rome, hey, this guy just said don't pay your taxes, and Jesus is in trouble with a really scary army. So either he gets in trouble with all of Jerusalem or he gets in trouble with Rome. That was their trap. Oh, yeah. But here's how Jesus gets them. Check this out. Jesus, he didn't have anything you could tax in the first place. Jesus, he, he once said, foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Jesus, he had zero money. Anytime he would get money, he would just give, give it away. Jesus, he fully relied on God for his daily bread. And so they couldn't get him with that one. In short, Jesus, he probably knew Psalm 24, 1, that said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants. See, one of the things I think Jesus is trying to teach us here is that sometimes we rely on the wrong things. Sometimes we get convinced that that some things like this are the most important thing in our life, and, and it's not. We know it's God. Right? We know that up here, but living that out can be hard. I tell you, especially as we get older, uh, sometimes we can be like the Pharisees. Sometimes we can talk all day about God, but we're really focused on something else. We can really get focused on money. And so what I want us to do today, this is, this is going to be our deal. You can keep this stack of money, but, oh yeah, but here's the deal. I want us to take one bill of every denomination, that's one dollar of every different color, and I'd like us to share it with somebody. Find somebody at the church and share it. It'll be our way of acting a little bit more like Jesus today. Deal? Deal. All right. Well, first, let's pray. God, Make your son our Lord over every sphere of our lives. Make him Lord over our time at church and our time at school. 
over our friendships and our relationships with the people we have a hard time with. God, make us, God, make Jesus our Lord above and beyond our money, our politics, our power, or our popularity. We thank you, God, for we know that you love us and are good to us. And that when we let you be Lord, when we let you truly be the one we listen to, we find you to be a great Lord indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I need you guys to stay for the baptism. And Lily, would you help Colleen and Eleanor pour the water in for me, please? Dinah, if you join me in the presenting your child for baptism, please come. That's great. Thank you. You guys just stay up here. On behalf of the session, I present Sarah Adelaide, Adelaide West, daughter of Jonathan and Rebecca West, to receive the sacrament of baptism. And do you wish for Sarah to be baptized to you? Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age, obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident in his promises. We baptize those whom the Lord God has called to be his own. In baptism, God claims us, and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By the water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined together in Christ with Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. And presenting Sarah for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want her to grow and study him, to know him, love him, and serve as his chosen disciple. I would ask you these questions of faith. Do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you? Do you renounce evil and affirm your reliance upon God's grace? Do you? Relying upon God's grace, do you intend to live the Christian faith, participate actively and responsibly in the mission and worship of the church, thereby teaching that faith to your child? To the congregation, do you, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Sarah by word and deed, to love and pray for, encouraging Sarah to know and follow Christ, and to be faithful members of this church? Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the waters of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. From it we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to move over this water that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it, raising them to new life and grafting them into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them that they may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the life of the risen Christ. Amen. Sarah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Defend, O Lord, your servant Sarah. Blessed be with her, guide her, fill her with your Holy Spirit. 
Defend her, Lord, until she comes to that place in your kingdom. Meanwhile, may she grow more and more in her faith and walk with you. We pray this all through Jesus' name. Amen. This is Sarah, a beloved child of the God's covenant, recipient of God's grace, God's love, all that is ours. We have also taken a very sacred vow, all of us, that for Sarah and for all of these young disciples, we will provide an environment where they grow in God's grace and love. Our prayer is that Sarah and these children will never know a day that they don't feel loved by God. And our task as a church is to provide that environment. Just so you know, that means we will teach Sunday school, help out in salt and light, even wash dishes. We will provide a way for her to experience God's love in a meaningful and practical way. We are blessed with these young disciples. God has entrusted them to us for us to love and care for them, that they would grow in the faith and support Jonathan and Rebecca and all their family as they provide that environment at home. We have been blessed. God bless you all. I guess I have to give her back now. <laughs> okay, you guys can head back. <laughs> Let us continue in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for our time together as church family, as those who desire a closer and deeper, more faithful walk with you. Hear us, Lord, as we come, seeking your blessings, grateful for your abundant kindness, wanting to hear your voice and to experience afresh your power and presence. We pray for those who struggle and hurt today. We pray for healing, knowing that you who created our bodies can certainly cure any disease or distress. And we also know that you're with us through any suffering or loss and that we never are really on our own. We pray for those facing the truths and mysteries of death and dying, for those who miss loved ones, for those who live with regrets, for those who long for hope and a new direction. We pray for those who are lonely or feel abandoned, rejected or unworthy. Bring them into a life-enriching relationship with those who help bring out their best. Speak to us, O Lord, in language we can understand. Help us recognize your love and grace in our lives and that you are 
at work accomplishing things in us and through us for your glory. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we will live by the same truths and priorities as yours. That what is most important to you will also matter most to us. We confess we are often easily distracted and doubtful. That sometimes we place our own selfish desires above your purpose and mission. We tell ourselves self-serving lies rather than accepting that our problems in life mostly begin with ourselves, our choices, and our unholy affections. We ask that you help us see things as they truly are. That we will desire a righteous relationship with you above all else and learn to live in humility and joy, following the example of Jesus more and more in our daily lives. We pray for our world. Longing for the day when Jesus returns and at last there is peace. Though there will always be war, injustice, and famine until the day of the Lord. Place your compassion and courage in us so that we will work toward the hope and the promise of that day, even today. Show us and guide us how we can contribute toward good, reflecting your grace and offer your hope in a world so broken and much in need. Hear, Lord, our silent prayers. We thank you, Lord, for your love and compassion, for hearing and responding to our prayers. Help us, Lord, to hear and respond to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth 
and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, grant us understanding of your word and how it applies to our lives. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. When the Roman army conquered and occupied a foreign land, periodically soldiers would travel to each community, bringing with them a statue, an image of the current Caesar. The people would be required to bow before the statue and say, Caesar is Lord, as they put incense in the fire that they burned in the presence of the image of the Roman Caesar. The point was to lay claim for loyalty to Caesar's rule in that place. When a new Caesar came into power, it was common practice to gather up all the old coins with the previous Caesar's image and then recast them with the imprint and image of the new Caesar as a sign that now he ruled everywhere that these coins circulated. After the planetary universe, the plants and animals had been created, the final stage of creation was God creating human beings starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The Romans used the image of Caesar to indicate their power to rule. And in a similar fashion, God laid claim to authority with his image. The fact that we bear God's image is sign and indication of God's sovereign power to rule wherever we circulate. Now, image doesn't mean that, we, that God necessarily looks like us, but in some way, the image of God has been placed or created in us as revealed as we reflect God's truth, glory, and purpose. At creation, God marked us with his image, marking us as his own meaning that we are called to exercise faithful dominion as stewards to protect and care for all of God's creation, as obedient bearers of God's image and glory and mission, so that in all that we do and say, all that we accomplish and achieve. Caesar's got his coins and God's got his, which are each one of us as we give ourselves freely, fully, and faithfully back to the Lord. Caesar used his coins that were marked with his image to establish his authority to rule throughout the empire. So too, the Lord God uses his coins, which are each of us, marked at creation with God's image to identify to whom we belong. So we are God's coins sent out into the world to make a difference as agents of transformation to reflect God's gracious love and truth, for we are to be the light in the world shining through the darkness, to reflect God's will, God's justice, mission, gracious love and purpose, and in fact, reclaiming God's kingdom wherever we circulate. The call is for us to influence to bring about hope and healing into this world by serving and circulating as the coins of God's kingdom that proclaim God's promise, God's truth, grace, and compassion by following the life example, mission, and ministry of Jesus Christ. As Janet just read in the Matthew passage, the temple authorities were troubled and distressed by Jesus. The crowds he stirred up had disturbed the peace of Passover with loud hosannas entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He'd interfered and disrupted the lucrative temple businesses when he drove out those selling sacrificial birds and animals and then overturned the tables of the temple money changers. He enthralled huge crowds with his miracles and teaching with parables that proclaimed God's grace over religious ritual and law, repeatedly accusing the religious authorities of hypocrisy. And so Jesus had to be stopped and silenced. The religious leaders recognized that as he became more popular, Jesus would become an even greater threat to their authority and prosperity. So while Jesus was teaching the crowds gathered at the temple, they came trying to trap him with kind of a gotcha trick question. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him with what he said. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. So tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? By asking, is it lawful? They're attempting to frame the debate as a theological and religious question. Is it lawful? Is it in accord with God's commandments? Or since it bothers my conscience and my religious sensitivity, do you think it's okay to pay this tax to the Romans? The Pharisees were referring to a very specific Roman tax. 
the much-hated census tax on every person over 12 who was living in occupied or conquered territory that had to be paid with a specific coin each year, which was then a symbol of their subjugation under Roman authority. And what made this tax even more onerous and offensive to the Jews was that the required Roman coin featured the inscription, Tiberius, son of divine Augustus, along with his image. For the Jewish religious perspective, this is a pagan idol. So much so that most Jews refused to carry or even touch such a blasphemous and idolatrous Roman coin. Now, it was politically adroit by the Romans to insist on that coin because everywhere that Roman denarius circulated was thereby marked as being under their influence and power. Sort of like planting a flag in a conquered territory as sign and symbol establishing authority to rule and to govern. Now, the religious authorities saw this unpopular or offensive tax is a perfect opportunity to entrap Jesus with an impossible question. If Jesus had just paid the tax, that would offend and turn the people against him. On the other hand, if Jesus said it's not lawful and you shouldn't pay the tax, they could accuse Jesus of inciting insurrection, which, of course, the Romans' authorities would crush. Either way, either answer could be exploited by his enemies to silence Jesus and put an end to his meddlesome ministry. And so so the story continues, verse 18. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered the emperor's. Now, they're standing in this crowded temple courtyard area, and in a very public way, the religious leaders have approached Jesus intending to embarrass and trip him up by asking if it's right from a religious perspective to go along with a tax that's paid with an idolatrous coin. When Jesus asks the leaders to show him one of the coins in question, one of them reaches into his pocket without thought and just holds it out to Jesus. They supply the coin. Jesus didn't have one. Their hypocrisy couldn't have been more blatant. Right there at the temple, the most holy and sacred place of all Judaism, they provided the coin that's really a pagan idol demonstrating they've already sold out to the idolatry of Caesar. Now, if it was really a problem of religious sensitivity and ethics, if it's really a matter of exclusive faithfulness to God, then what are they doing even possessing that coin, much less bringing it to the holy ground of the temple? They're the ones carrying around Caesar's image, not Jesus. They're the ones who have bought into Caesar's system, not Jesus. For they had the idle coin in their pocket, not Jesus. How hypocritical to carry and accumulate wealth using that coin and then bring it with you into the temple, the holy place of God, and claim it offends your religious sensitivities. That issue was not the faith and moral question of the law that they opposed to Jesus. But as Jesus reveals, it's about their hypocrisy and greed. And so Jesus turns the trap right back on them. Verse 20, Then he, Jesus, said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Since Caesar has an image and title stamped on that coin, like some kid's underwear marked for going off to summer camp, Jesus tells him to just give Caesar back what he claims, give it back to Caesar, that which is stamped with his image. But the heart and point of this passage is the second part of his answer. And give to God or render or give back the things that are God's, which raises the fundamental question before us. 
and just what exactly are the things that belong to God. That is, what things specifically bear God's image? Earlier we read the answer to that question. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Where has God claimed his claim with an image? And what belongs to God? We do. We bear God's image, so therefore we belong to God. And that truth is the reason we baptize Sarah today. Baptism is a sign and declaration of God already at work in our lives, and it serves to remind us of God's promise and covenant as it reassures us of God's life-transforming, healing love as we're invited to live and grow into that image we bear. For Presbyterians, baptism is a window through which we can see the grace of God. For what better than the baptism of an infant or child to symbolize and bear witness to the truth that God's love lays claim to us, even before we have knowledge or can respond with any faith. In this passage, Jesus is reminding us that we already belong to God, that we are the coins of God's realm, God's beloved treasure. And so the challenge that Jesus posed to his critics and accusers was not to determine what Caesar's and what belongs to God. Truth is, what belongs to Caesar? None of it. Not a single coin. But rather, all of creation belongs to its creator. As we read in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Therefore, all we are, all that we have and possess, we've received only through the mercy and grace, the blessings of God, and trusted for us to use for a while for the glory of God. And that is the heart of godly, gracious, and faithful stewardship of all God has blessed and entrusted to our care and discipleship. God has entrusted to it so to it all to us, but it still belongs to the Lord and has been put into our care only for a short while, no longer than the few years of our mortal lives, and God will evaluate how we use this abundance of our lives. We each one decide we choose how to use our lives and our resources. And so the question is, Am I focused primarily on acquiring more wealth and worldly security or on choosing to respond to God's blessings and grace through faithful stewardship of God's creation? Yes, most of us really want to be faithful stewards. And we do want Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Master even over our money, our time, and our blessings. But the stark reality and difficult truth is the attractive glitter and glitz of this world and all that it has to offer is a spiritual struggle we'll battle so long as we breathe and live. And that's the main point and purpose of Christian discipleship. For that's how we can overcome the polluting toxins of our culture of materialism, consumerism, selfishness, and our fear of scarcity. By recognizing the lordship of Jesus Christ over all we possess, including life itself, our time, our talents, and resources, as we faithfully live out the blessings as God intended, we can accomplish good, useful, and meaningful things in this world. The truth and grace and blessings of God's promise is this, as Jesus explained if we put the Lord God first, then everything else will fall right into place. Jesus said in Matthew 6, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And that is the word of God. Let us pray. We do thank you, Lord, for life is truly amazing. 
We're stunned that you would entrust us with so much that you do love us even when we fail and ceaselessly call us back. Lord, help us hear and respond to your loving grace. Help us walk with you, grow in our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and join in hymn 697, Take My Life. And now may the grace, the mercy, and peace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.